Always good to try and kind of catch Licorice doing janitor duty on waves. Weren't getting that kill anywhere else. Well, that does open up the opportunity for Cloud9 to take the tier two bottom though. That is the last tier two turret on the map that was standing for Immortals, now gone. Baron power play is currently only at plus 1200, which is under the value that taking the Baron itself gives your team. Mm. So Cloud9 needs to get a little more out of this for it to really feel worthwhile. Once Licorice respawns in 10 seconds, he will have TP to be able to join this fight. Hakuo nearly taken out. The damage and the range are so oppressive from Sven in these trades. As the bottom lane inhibitor turret falls, TP is channeled, and Cloud9 will utilize the last 70 seconds of this Baron to push hard in mid and bottom lane. Yep, fun fact, Senna autos do not get blocked by Windwall because they are not projectiles, so it makes it even harder for them to defend. Would Smith be rooted up? This could be bad news here for the side of Immortals. They will disengage properly, but they have already lost inhibitor number one. Number two now the target. Baron enchanted minions in two lanes. The cannons just harassing Alltech there in the bottom side. As you'll see the mid lane inhibitor fall here in just a moment. And that is two inhibs taken out. Plus 2,000 now on that Baron power play clock. And that means Cloud9 are feeling good about the state of this game. Elder spawns in 30. Yeah, what were we saying before that Baron happened? They'll use the Baron, get in Hibs, and that'll open it up for Elder for them to be able to get that. Yeah, every you, uh, predicted that pretty well. Every move in this game has kind of been like clockwork for C9. They, it, like, the very first play of Sven soloing Ica, that's the individual outplay, right? Niski soloing Ica. Yeah, sorry, Niski soloing Ica. But from there, it's every other play just kind of rolled off. It's like, okay, he now has mid priority, so they might just win here. Uh, Hakuo will find himself CC'd, but they don't have everybody else nearby, so they don't want to go in. They're still waiting on two of their members to come into this fight. Smith is going to be forced to stasis here very early. Vulcan's going to be drawing all the fire. But speaking of fire, the artillery once again will rain down on Immortals. The damage is there. They are gone, gone, gone. Cloud9. Five for one. There it is. Immortals tried the desperation play. They were tired of C9s. Just perfect play around the map. Tried to make something happen. Unable to kill Sven and Vulcan as they go for the all-initiation. And that, Captain Flowers, was a rout. Elder not required in what I believe is the cleanest game we've seen so far in these first couple of weeks. Cloud9, smash Immortals. And as I was saying before they got that final fight, is everything in that game was just in sequence, one play rolling into the next. The mid play into the first Drake, into the Rift Herald that they can get, into breaking a turret, into a turret dive bottom lane once the top lane was gone, into the next Drake, and so on and so forth. Like the global usage, the early lead, and just not making those mistakes is what is separating C9 even though it's only three games, what is separating C9 from the rest of the league right now? I can't wait until they play Dignitas because they played very well today as well. But there's a, really there's a difference in the way these teams approach the game. C9 is picking champions that have an advantage from minute one onwards that will not have an advantage at 30 minutes if they do not make plays. But they have been making the plays in this game and that was impressive. Cloud9 looking so good here in these first three games. Deathless on three members, Blabber, Sven, Vulcan. Not one of them saw a black and white screen that entire game. So well done by this team. Four out of five champions on Cloud9 in that game had a global or semi-global ultimate. And yeah. it just played into how seamless it made their communication and their plays look. Yeah, there couldn't be a spot on the map where Immortals could go. And it's, it's really interesting too, because when we're looking at this C9, team before the season. We're saying, okay, Sven is gone, Sneaky is gone, Zazel is gone. That's like the shot calling core. How are they going to look after the first 15 minutes? Pretty good so far, right? Yeah. Their boot camp has been solid. I think Vulcan is proving to be such a great addition as well. They look super good. Well, in the wake of that super good looking victory, let's go ahead and send things down to Avli, who's standing by with Cloud9's top laner. Thanks, Flowers. Cloud9 is looking super good because they are remaining undefeated with this victory. Now, Licorice with uh, Week 2 and TSM and Team Liquid still looking a little shaky. People are now looking at Cloud9 as the top team. So do you see Cloud9 as the clear number one or is there a uh, threat in the league? 
Um, I mean, I think right now the only team that looks super threatening to us is Dignitas because they're also the only undefeated team. Um, I think if we beat them, we'll be like the clear number one. But until then, it's like I think we're stronger, but it's hard to say for sure. Now, a lot of people are looking at Dignitas and Froggen is the main menace. Do you agree with that or is there something greater? Um, I mean, I think they had a really strong start. I think that like they're, they're shaping up to look like a strong team. I think that a lot of teams will pick up as the play goes on. Um, but right now, they're probably our number one opponent. And looking at you and Cloud9, you entered the team as a rookie on a team full of veterans, and now you are the longest standing member. So what's the team like for you personally now that Sven Skarin and Sneaky are no longer on the roster? Um, I mean, with the new guys, it's been it's been good. Like, we started early. We boot camped in Korea. We worked on Team Synergy because we like came in as like a new team, like a lot of fresh players, and like not having those old guard there like really changes the team dynamic. Um, and so far, it's been really good. So I'm really proud of my team. Do you feel like you have a little bit more weight or clout when it comes to team decisions? Um, I don't know if I'd say that. I think like at the end of the day, I think Reefert is like the big boss, <laughs> yeah. um, and like everyone just gives their input, and I think we just all work really well together. Well, your next match is going to be against 100 Thieves. Now, they've been having a little bit of difficulty in the early game, but they somehow pull off the win in the late. So is that something that you take into account when you prepare for them? Um, not really. <laughs> I, I mean, I think we play a pretty clean game right now, apart from me dying uh, right after we got Baron. Like, they, we close out the game really cleanly. And I think as long as we play like that, we should win tomorrow as well. Final question for you. Uh, I saw that you guys banned set on your side. I believe someday broke out the set for today and had a pretty good performance on that. Is that a champion that you are a little nervous to go against in the top lane? Um, I think with the new champions, it's kind of just like it's like this wild card effect where when we look at ourselves, we are like we are a really strong team, and if we play standard, we like win most games. So if we just don't open up the set that like might randomly like one v five a team fight, then it's just easier for us. Well, Akrish, thank you, and congratulations again on the win. And for everyone else, stick around, because after the break, we're going to see Golden Guardians take on Evil Geniuses. Warwick, are they typing? Yeah, yeah they said better than the real win no matter what. Ugh. Oh, shit. Yeah, so I hate awesome. that bug. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, nothing new. Finding a Woo! really good trade onto Ika here. Ignite drop down nicely done. Right, 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 right. Yeah, go flash, go Can I flash? I can so, I can so. So, I'm on Karma. Nice. Cover the flash. Yeah. Okay. I'm on the rift still. Rift, 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 rift. Finn! Grabbing a killing spree there onto Hakuo. Double kill for him. All techs gone. Man, Immortals just lost three. They're all dead. They're all dead. They're all dead. Oh. No! My stopwatch! Oh, you can see on my screen. I died, man. I'm one, two. You've got your own car with your own insurance. Thanks, Steph. No more driving that old hand-me-down. Surprise! Surprise! No, I'm not gonna get a date in this. We had a lot of great dates in this car. <laughs> Ugh, no, no, just ew. When you're chasing greatness, just remember, it's not about what you say, it's about what you do.
Hello, and welcome to a special mini edition of This or That. Part two. They have asked us to do an intro for Golden Guardians and Evil Genius. Let's see what they've cooked up. Three slides for this one. Yeah, a little bite-sized dose. Match specific. Number one. Who will <laughs> who oh, will win lady? The Italian Stallion or the Golden God? So we got to see some good play out of both these guys, particularly on LeBlanc in week number one. We saw Jazuke absolutely pop off on Monday Night League, carrying evil geniuses, going up against 100 Thieves all over the map, left, right, and center, pop, 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 like a bunch of balloons <laughs> in a needle factory, blowing people up. Golden Glue, he had a good game himself on the first day. Unfortunately, that ended up being a throw to the same team that these guys beat. So just based off LeBlanc performances against 100 Thieves, a very common metric all players are measured on, mm. I'm gonna go with the Italian style. Giddy up. Well, that's a great analysis and all. You know how a lot of mid laners win mid lane? How is that? Jungle diff. Uh, okay, jungle. <laughs> <laughs> and Jazuke has MVP, former MVP, jungler, Sven Skarin, mm -hmm. who admittedly did have a bad opening game. So it is possible for uh, Sven Skarin to have a bad game, but Closer is also a, a jungler that has really impressed me. So when you even bring in the jungle diff uh, part to the who's gonna win mid lane, both of them I think have really good partners to rely upon, but I'm gonna give the slight edge to Jizuke and Sven Skarin. All right, so we both went with this on number one. Let's hit up number two, what do we got? Keith McBrief. <laughs> roll is swap. the roll swap worth or actually not worth to me? I think Keith actually did pretty well uh, in the first week of LCS, roll swapping over. Yep. Uh, I, as a whole, that lane isn't that strong though. As far as what I thought it was gonna be, I actually had lower expectations <laughs> for Keith. So I was like, hey, that was pretty good. And he just roll swapped over. Ah, man, it is a real tough one for me. So break the ice. So see, for me, the way I'm looking at it is from the perspective of what is the path to consistently playing LCS right now for these players? So when you're looking at a role like AD carry or mid or jungle, honestly just not top of support, these are the ones that people usually wanna import more for these big name like League of Legends, Hollywood stars from other regions, come in, have them carry your team, get to playoffs, go to Worlds, hope we don't lose in groups, yada, 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 whatever. But if you want to be an LCS player, it is more realistic if you are not in that double lift Bjergsen Jensen tier of players to get in there as a support because it's less populated with these superstar players. I don't think it's, the question is, is the swap worth for Keith or not? Because I'm looking at it from Keith's point of view, man. <laughs> Who's gonna think about Keith? Okay, okay. I'm thinking about Keith. And for <laughs> Keith, I think this was a smart career move. I say worth. If we look at it for the lens of Keith, is the roll swap worth? He's in the LCS. Hell yeah! It's Hell worth. yeah! All right, next slide. <laughs> Golden Guardians win condition. Is it Hanser? Is it closer? For me, boom, it's closer. This guy was all over the place. He's creating action for the team. I think he has to be a big part of Golden Glue winning over Juzuke, which we went over in slide number one, because mid lane right now, trying to transition is gonna be a very big deal. Plus, trying to get control of the neutral objectives nowadays. So I think it's gotta be closer. Top line, top lane is still an island. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna include is some data that I saw on Twitter from, I can't remember who exactly it was that did the poll, but they pulled a lot of pro players about which roles you think are the most and least impactful. Mid and jungle were far and away most impactful. This is not where you wanna rely on your game carrying win condition to be. That, however, is big time. And we already talked about how that dude's the one who really caught everybody's attention in week number one. Gotta go with there. All right, I think that does it for us. Is that all three slides? We're done. Let's get in the game. See you there. We might be there. I'm not sure. Are we casting it? Oh, I'm not sure. We'll find out. Nope, it's us. Thanks for the intro though, Kobe <laughs> and Flowers. I'm Julian Pastry Time Car. Excited to bring you game number four alongside the OG Evil Genius, Isaac Azale Cummings Bentley. That's true. Spent uh, quite a few years on that team myself. Well, now we get to watch them play League. Let's get a refresher of the rosters though, competing on stage. On the blue side, it is Evil Geniuses. In the top lane, Kumo. Ooh. In the jungle, Sven Skarin. Mid laner, Jazuke. Bot and support, Bang and Zazel. And their coaches, Irian and Artemis. Yeah, fancy new intros loading up on the red side today. It's going to be Golden Guardians in the top lane. Hauntzer in the jungle. Closer. 
mid laner Golden Glue. Bot and support going to be FBI alongside Keith with coaches Nero and Choo Choo's. Now, turning towards that jungle matchup, we've got the Summer Honda MVP squaring up against the Summer TCL MVP, who actually had a pretty stellar week one, all things considered. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people were really calling out a solid performance from Closer. They didn't pick up some wins, but he had some incredible performances. In particular, his quad buff start against 100 Thieves, you know, taking all the buffs across the map against Meteos. And a lot of people have got their eyes on this jungle matchup. You know, if you want to prove yourself in a new league, you're coming from a smaller region, you are the reigning MVP there. What better way than to take down the reigning MVP of this league? And I think as expected, uh, these two players on new teams, spent of course moving teams away from Cloud9, close up uh, in a brand new league, so of course on a new team. Mm -hmm. I think you can look to these players to you know, be the be the people that get things going, especially in these early weeks why, why you're still figuring out exactly how your team wants to play and where your strengths are. Junglers always have influence early on in the game, and they're both clearly very capable of getting things done early. And I think that's one of the interesting things about, you know, watching pro junglers right now is that as you get later and later into the game, their individual role becomes less important because they are so underleveled compared to the solo laners. You know, they spend so much time in pro playing around lanes, playing around vision, and that means that while they are an incredibly important part to get their laners ahead, they're often not the ones who can then push you across that finish line, unless they're on a big playmaker, something like a Lee Sin or a Gragas who can really have an impactful ultimate to take over a team fight. You know, they have to dominate that early game and then put the trust in their teammates to be able to make good on the advantages that they have earned for them. And I think for EG's last win that we saw, it was just okay, really kind of reaping the benefits there. Golden Blue certainly has shown that he can uh, get leads, but I think for Golden Guardians in general, it's, it has been closing those games. There's been more of the difficulty, but still, things will start in Champ Select. We've got uh, Elise and GP banned by Evil Geniuses, and Akali and Lucian also starting to become a mainstay of the ban list as well. Yeah, they've been pretty much banned every game. Rumble, another one that you are expecting. EG going to be banning that out. Set has been very high priority in the LEC and also in the LCS thus far, so you are expecting Set to kind of rise in priority. Senna going to be taken off the table, so I'm looking already at things like Aphelios, looking at Set, and champions that have been very, very popular for those early picks, but it's actually going to be the first pick Tom Kench, which I can't say I love simply because you are grabbing this and then, you know, seeding lane control in the 2v2, very likely bot lane, you're giving Golden Guardians more options to be able to actually pick for a winning 2v2 there. You know, it does kind of, I think, tip their hand a little bit that they want to play with one of those more kind of defensive marksmen who don't have, it, you know, their own kind of safety uh, in that kit with Aphelios taken away. You know, I'm already thinking, hey, maybe EG want to play something like the MF who can really benefit from having Tom Kench alongside her. Well, there is Aphelios and Nautilus. I assume the support there for Keith. Although there are some options if they do want to be flexible with it. Still haven't really seen that champion flex around too much, at least lately. So we'll see what EG want to pick here for number two and three. Sadly not expecting that one, as fun as it would be. But uh, LeBlanc, that both these mid laners have played, is still around if they want to take it now before it could potentially be snatched away or banned up. Sona would be a spicy one if they take it. So Sona Top is actually gaining a lot of popularity and it is going to get locked in. So there is a possibility that this is going to be Sona Top. That is what I'm expecting. You also have to remember that it can be flexed around. There was a period where there was a lot of Sona Taric. Sona Tom Kench was the other kind of option there. Uh, so there is a possibility of that being flexed, you know, depending on what top laners are picked, depending on you know, how comfortable they're going to feel in that. But regardless of where it's played, a Sona with an incredible amount of gold does scale very, very well. And one of the most underrated things, something I was talking you know, recently with Kobe about, is the incredible amount of move speed that you get. This AoE move speed from that Sona E you know, starts at something like 25% flat move speed scaling with AP. It does get very, very powerful. But Fjord gonna be picked in here. This is a great matchup into the Aatrox. You can go mid or top. You know, you can try to follow the Aatrox around the map and, and be able to look to fight it there. The other reason I really do like the Fiora pick is that if you are going to play a Sona comp, no matter what lane the Sona is in, Sona at some point wants to group and walk around in this death ball. Fiora is a really good answer to pull people elsewhere on the map, right? Unless Evil Geniuses draft hard engage alongside that team fight kind of 5v5 death ball, they can't actually force fights. And Fiora can pull you apart on the map and really start to exploit the weaknesses that can show up in those side lanes. Yeah, have seen Hornster actually have pretty good games, so excited to see him on a fairly dominant carry 
as Talia also going to be banned away alongside J4, so jungle is getting targeted now. Yeah, we are expecting it to go to Haunter, but it's a possibility that Golden Goo pl could play it. That's you know, remember, we have seen this even you know, a while ago, who he played it yep. actually in the mid lane in the LCS a year or two ago now. He's under them in but Academy playing spot now, maybe he taught it to Golden Glue. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where you can actually just follow your kind of lane matchup around the map, right? Yep. You can follow this Aatrox wherever the Aatrox does go, try to get advantages there. Jarvan going to be banned out, banning out one of those AD junglers that is very heavily you know, prized. We could see Golden Guardians do something like they ban out the J4, they take the lease in themselves, try to push EG towards more of that magic damage where you know they may become a little bit one-dimensional in that consistent DPS. Yeah, I think it's part of why Tilia and Elise has already eaten a few bans. Gragas also in that wheelhouse, so another AP jungler also taken away. Yeah, Lee, Lee just makes a lot of sense, right? If you're going to ban out J4, Lee Sin, Gragas, you know, there, there's, those are kind of some of the top picks. So Lee Sin's still available. They are going to be grabbing that up for themselves. And they will have what we're expecting to be Golden Glue's picks saved for last. Rek'Sai does make quite a bit of sense here alongside as a good answer to that Lee Sin. It is kind of considered a pretty preferential 1v1 matchup. You can actually unburrow, interrupt the Q fairly easily there. Has a lot of early game pressure to match that of the Lee Sin. And you know, put alongside that Orianna does give you a little bit more utility as you get into later stages because you can act as that kind of shockwave delivery system. So this is very much looking like the Sona TK bot lane. Yep. So this should be Bang playing the Sona alongside Zazel's Tom Kench. It does make sense why they picked that Tom Kench early if they were thinking about going for something like this. Definitely will not be the Ash getting picked in here. No. Um, Syndra considered a pretty good matchup generally into Orianna. Yep. Fairly skill based, but this is going to be an interesting one because when you look at Evil Genius' composition, this is something that has to 5v5 generally to win. It's not a composition that is going to dominate through side lanes. You can answer split push utilizing the Tom Kench ultimate to try to get an you know, odd number of fights and try to collapse onto those plays. But you know, Golden Guardians have a much more well-rounded comp. You know, they can potentially 5v5, but they also have that split push win condition. So we'll see how well Closer can play around Haunter's Fiora because that is going to be a really big deal. And Kumo has been exploitable during his short time in the LCS. He has not been turning in the most impressive laning phases. If Haunter can get a big advantage there, Golden Guardians can look to avoid the 5v5, avoid that Sona strength in the later stages of the game and try to peel them apart. I do like that Golden Guardians are at least staying consistent with this draft. They effectively counterpick both solo lanes and they're going to try and play early game, which is what we've seen from them using Close's early game strength as a jungler to kind of get them somewhere and then hopefully a big enough lead to take over the game. That has at least been uh, what they've looked to do in their first two games, despite not picking up a win yet, but certainly well set up to pick up their first win here up against EG. But EG are playing something that we might have expected to see last season. We haven't seen Sona TK no. for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting because we have been hearing some talk about Sona as a top laner, you know, in solo queue. Soraka as a top laner has gotten a lot of popularity, and I've actually been expecting to see Sona as an answer. It, it's kind of funny because you take these two champions from the support role. Sona has always been a great matchup into Soraka, and you can actually just do the same things, you know, in those solo lanes. But seeing it here in that bot lane for Bang, very interesting, and it you know, could be a bit of a, a kind of meta-defining moment here in the LCS. If this succeeds, you can see more teams going that way, and I think. A lot of people had enough Sonoteric last year, so maybe not hoping it's going to succeed. Well, I guess we'll see, but EG and GG will move out onto the Rift for our last LCS game of the day. Certainly something I think Sazel so probably feels comfortable here. He's played a lot of Tom Kench in his career so far. Yeah, most of those LCS pros have played a lot of Tom yep, Kench. he had to do it. It's become such a staple. You know, no matter how low the win rate gets in solo queue, it's such a good competitive pick because of how how well coordinated you can be with the team. Utilizing this ultimate moving around the map is such an important part of pro play. And it also allows these incredibly talented, you know, carry players to play more aggressively and get more out of their champions, knowing that they have this kind of get out of jail free card. Well, to maybe shed some more light on the draft, Riv is standing by with Irene. Thank you, gentlemen. I am joined by the coach of Evil Geniuses. If you could just give us a little window into the Soraka time, we've been seeing a lot of, or I'm sorry, the Sona time, we've been seeing a lot of Soraka and healing. Is that kind of to get healing on the map and have a strong bot lane? Yeah, I think so. It's similar with the Soraka, but I think Sona should be much more stable. And also I think he has some CC, so I think it should be much better at mid-late game. 
And is there anything now with this Sona Tom pick on the other side that scares you, that Fiora late game? Is there anything you told the players to watch out for? Yeah, so I worried about just Fiora split push, but I think we have Tom Ken, so I think about just cover the death side first, and we can play out whatever we want. Perfect, Irene. Thank you very much. Best of luck to the team. Thank you. Back to you. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know, basically what I talk about in draft, I mean, you do always have to be concerned when you're playing, you know, 5v5 comp that doesn't have incredible siege about your opponents being able to have win conditions that aren't that 5v5. And that's why he's going to be worried about that Fiora and the threat that that can bring. You know, and it's going to be a lot on Zazel to be able to actually answer those side lane plays and or Sven Skarin to keep Ponser down in the early game so that he can't just completely run over Kumo that's in what is a good matchup. Done. Golden Glue will proc Electrocute there. As we can now hitting level two, trying to keep these minions away from his tower. As he trades a bit of damage back with the ball. Uh, junglers are now on the same side of the map. Looks like they both pass from right to left. So we'll see if maybe Kuma or Hornster gets an early visit at all. Uh, you can also see that I think a, a lot of these players are expecting this to be more of a farm style game. Triple teleports across the map. You know, people looking at, at relatively defensive lanes, playing more for priority to try to get advantages for their junglers through that, rather than looking for straight up aggressive 2v2s or 1v1s. You know, Golden Glue, Jazuke, both taking teleport, Bang and FBI both taking teleport here too. So uh, both teams feeling relatively comfortable, I think, you know, to scale towards the later stages of the game and just play around uh, that. So far, the early part of the landing phase has gone well for Haunts of Kumo. Mm -hmm. We'll pick up a lot of farm here though. Yeah, this is this is pretty much a no fun zone for Aatrox. It's a really tough matchup as uh, we're gonna see Sven Skaring coming up for Golden Glue, but he's playing to the side that Closer is on, so this is good positioning from him. And we'll see if they are gonna go. Closer's here now. They know. Oh, actually pushed them back. Good flash there from Golden Glue. The TP's come in. Closer gonna look to try and shut this out, shut this down, but no follow up and kind of a waste of. Cooldowns there from Haunts, though. Yeah, I don't think the Q actually connected from Closer, so that was going to mean they probably would not have lethal damage. It is actually a trade of flashes, but it's a flash off Golden Glue, so Sven Serret's going to be happy about how this gank worked out. Yeah, he's down his flash, but he got the mid laner's flash and the top laner's TP, so that is a very worthwhile play, but... You know, it's not the end of the world for Haunter because he did actually get his base. And because he had fully reset the wave, he really doesn't lose much off of this besides, you know, maybe allowing Kumo to have an easier reset himself. So, you know, most of, of this lane is going to be Kumo on the back foot. Aatrox does struggle in this matchup. Fiora can both poke you down utilizing the vitals. And also the all in becomes very difficult because Fiora can simply save the parry for your Q3. That sweet spot damage is very, very easy to parry, very telegraphed. And without that, it's incredibly difficult uh, for the Aatrox to actually win those all ins. Oh no, Closer going to lose oh. it to Kumo. Didn't have Did smite. Did not have smite. It's a few seconds off. So Kumo going to roam down and take that Scuttle Crab. Yeah, that feels really bad. Not only is that a lot of experience, uh, but it's also the gold loss there for Closer and the time spent to actually clear out that camp. So pretty frustrating. It gives away the fact that he is going to be up on the top side of the map. So they can expect that he would be over on Krugs now. And you know, as a result, your team spends care and move up to that side. He knows he needs to cover Kumo right now because Kumo has not actually fought yet. Uh, and if Lee Sin is up here, Kumo could be in a little bit of a dangerous spot. Also, while we're tracking the six TPs in this game, uh, both mid laners did TP back to lane. And Bang is also TP back to bot lane here. Is Haunter going to get pulled in? Loses that trade to Kumo as he finds the skill shots and the sweet spots. But again, Fiora not too worried here. In fact, Haunter really not that interested in doing much other than farming. He's actually gone call second. Yeah. yeah, and I think it, it speaks to what they're expecting the game to be, right? Six teleports, you're going for an early call, you know, you're looking to scale, you're looking to get advantages. Fjord can win early, but you know, you're pretty much guaranteed to win late, so you know, is looking to play around that. Hunter knows, though, he's in a dangerous spot. This is a lane pushing in, he wants to reset it, but Rek'Sai is actually tunneled behind him, and now he has no parry, so they should go. Yep, there's the chain as well, Hunter gets out, but now he's he gonna flash. Garen. Gonna have to flash, oh, flashes late, gets knocked up, Kumo flashes in, and first blood on the table, oh. not quite over! Not enough source on this on that blade to take down Haunter. Yeah, just barely not enough damage there. Remember, Kubo had not spent his gold, so missing the extra AD that he potentially could have had to secure that first blood. Either way, they're going to be able to push in the wave, so farm denied here from Haunter. Haunter has no teleport because it was spent mid lane, so he has to hoof it back up to the top lane and you know, is going to be set back as a result of this, but Golden Guardians making a quick play down on that bottom side. The investment of that top lane gank means Closer can take the time to actually grab this dragon and start stacking that up for the squad. 
The next one will be Cloud as well, which uh, is always fun. But I think the thing I like about it is that it means the soul will either be Ocean or Infernal, which at least for most people have been kind of the highly prized ones. Yeah, I think those are the two that are the easiest to get immediate benefit from, right? You know, you, you don't have to have any specific type of comp. You know, people talk a lot about, well, Mountain Soul is great if you have tanks, you know, Cloud is really great if you have someone who, could, who really needs that move speed, like, oh, you have a cast in your Singe or Mord or whatever. Um, but when you have Infernal and when you have Ocean, they're just always good, generically really, really strong. And, you know, that is going to be a win condition for these two squads who are looking to play passively, are looking to scale. And you can see that through the item buys. It was an early tier purchased up here from Bang. He is looking to scale up, have enough mana to really become that essentially walking fountain later on in the game that Sona can be with a, a lot of stacks of mana. You know, and, and Sona, especially in, in this new season, can sometimes do that even more. And he is actually playing Presence of Mind. So, you know, not only are you getting the flat 500 mana once you have those five kills or assists stacked up, but Anytime you are getting kills and assists in the fights, you're getting this massive injection of mana because it is a 20% return of your mana bar. You have a cr tremendous amount with the Seraphs plus that 500 flat plus your base. And you know even Lich Bane, you're getting more flat mana. So you can get ridiculous amounts of mana return to Sona in these team fights. And that's one of the things that makes it where you can just kind of have what feels like this infinite healing. Always nice to have. Uh, the other note, of course, is that I haven't seen Sona TK since last season and that lane operated very differently. Of course, the support items have been changed again, so there isn't any CS sharing happening like yeah. they might have been. So Bang's CS number is his CS number. His support is not sharing with him. So FBI doing well on that front, but I don't really expect Sona to be a particularly robust 2v2 laner. But uh, yeah. doing just fine as Golden Guardians have rotated up for this Rift Herald. You mostly just don't want to get exploited, right? You know, it, it's fine to be a bit down as far as the farm goes because you are looking heavily towards scaling with that early tier and you're just trying to play stable. But there is going to be a contest here. EG is moving over. Jazuke has Ooh, all. Oh, what a flash shot! Oh! Into the top by three! Closer! Low force to flash out. FBI with the counter ulti, but just to try and keep them away. And EG take full control of the arena. Oh, a great combo there from Bang and Jazuke, but. Not quite enough damage to actually take them out. And there is a nice little trade there from Haunter. You can catch the parry stun over on Takumo. Uh, but he does know Ichi has control up on this top side of the map. So he has to be scared about a return gank here, about EG coming up in this side of the area. And it will be EG grabbing that Rift Herald. So they could actually drop this top lane. And with Haunter being put behind by the early gank, with the Bramble Vest rush here from Kumo, things can get a little bit more tricky. But it's now Keith roaming up to the top side, looking to try to get a little bit of safety for his top laner. You can see he runs straight up to top, and Keith actually ran all the way up there just to drop this pink right in that in that brush. So, you know, giving additional protection for Hanser to make sure that what is this potential win condition for later on is farming, is getting experience, is, is really playing that safe, and it's a real bro move there from Keith. <laughs> He's been learning the role, helping out Haunter there, who certainly is expected to, I think, carry a lot of the mm -hmm. mid to late game burden. Wanting to play the sideline on Fiora, Golden Glue, currently in a 1v2. As Zazel and Bang have decided to occupy mid lane for a short while. But doing just fine, as mostly just farm being traded back and forth. Still almost 10 minutes in and no first blood. As you mentioned, yeah. with the 6 TPs, we're expecting more of a slower early game, and it certainly has been that. But the Cloud Drake will be spawning in a minute and 10. So we'll see if GG can stack that up once again. Yeah, you can see uh, it is likely going to be the Super Soaker build here from Yuzuke. You know, already has that first component. Uh, going to be working towards that. That's something that is getting very, very popular. Uh, the Hextech GLP, people just really like the control. We're seeing it a lot on Orion, especially alongside Phase Rush. This is airy, so it is more of that kind of a uh, little pokey and a little bit more utility later on with the additional shielding, but still, the slowdown going to be very helpful. You know, EG is going to want to have long team fights where you are actually getting the most out of the healing and the shielding and multiple rounds of those to kind of, you know, poke down your opponent, engage them, reset, look to heal back up, and then force fights around objectives. Uh, so I do think it, it makes a lot of sense kind of going for what is going to add more control here. Looks like just the standard vision clearing being done by Golden Guardians here. Trying to make enough space to take this second Drake for themselves. It'll be up in a little under 20 seconds. FBI and Zazel still doing battle over the wall thanks to that turret that Achelios was able to place over. My one concern about this build here from Kumo is that it's, it's so incredibly defensive that you know when you go into the team fight, you're not going to have a lot of threat. You know, this is 
much more just kind of focused on surviving and perhaps he feels that's all he needs to do if he can just survive and hold the wave that he's going to be successful but when you're stacking this much armor against the Fiora with an early Ravenous you can actually just heal up off the minions and you know so much true damage coming out of Fiora's kit that the armor becomes largely ineffective later on. Pretty interesting here if you actually drop the Herald mid and I assume they wanted to use it to retake control of the Drake pit, but they're actually just committed to try and siege him. Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to be happy just kind of getting some damage down on this. There's Golden Blue. I they have to wait. flash here. Oh, good oh, off from Bang. Flash. That's going to be first blood. That was terrible from Golden Glue. I think that was pretty obvious that he needed to flash. Bang just kind of walking up as easy as you like. Didn't even have to flash for the Sona ultimate. You get shockwaved in there. You got to use your summoner. You got to get out of there. As soon as Sona ult hits you, you're going to be absolutely dead and he was yeah i think just maybe expecting to live and clearly did not yeah. as bang was able to nail him there with the crescendo as the ocean rift does now take over Hunter at least got some free time so he's picking up gold and farm in the top mm -hmm. lane but the drakes will be split as well watch this again a great shockwave here from jazuke yeah this was a great shockwave but he has tons of time and yeah, he's walking. Is, is clearly just walking straight towards you perhaps he thought Maybe I can hit him with Scatter of the Week and save my, my Flash, you know, save that Summoner spell, but a Golden Glue just getting too greedy there and does get punished, gives up that first blood. You know, not only did the Turret Plate then go over to Jizuke, it is also that first blood gold, so, you know, getting this Orianna online, and Jizuke was a real difference maker for EG in their win last week on the Plunk. He was taking over the game, so it's a guy that you have to be worried about getting that early lead. He's up uh, almost 800 gold individually in the 1v1, and actually yep. DLP has already been completed. Pretty cost-efficient item, but certainly a good spike early on for the Ori. Yeah, he's going to be feeling really, really good about that. We have the Seraphs already bought up there from Fang. You know, he's going to be stacking up this Archangel, looking to transform it into the Seraphs, and Warriors through. So a lot of these major completions are already coming across for EG. They are a little bit ahead of the curve as far as that goes, but Hauntzer still going to be pretty happy about farming it out here on this top side because of some of this pressure from the jungle, because of the fact that he lost his flash and TP'd mid. He is down a bit on farm, but he has almost cashed out this cult. Off of that, he will have the Ravenous buy, which is where you really can start to shrug off a lot of that Aatrox harass. And it'll just be a question of, can he play aggressively enough and does he have the vision to actually allow himself to, to push into the turret and start to look to poke away at that turret? Or can they actually dive Kumo and then get onto that turret? Because Fiora kills turrets insanely fast. Patch here onto Zazel, perhaps he will flash away. Keith still ready with the ulti, but no follow-up there from either side. Yeah. A good little force of the summoners, though. They get the exhaust, they get that flash, and uh, they don't want to overcommit too hard because of how effective EG can be in these long fights. If you don't have lethal damage, the Sona starts to heal you back up. Tom Kench denies a lot of those kills. Zuke was roaming up as well. So I think it was smart to play that patiently from Golden Guardians. And there is that Ravenous Hydra buy from Hauntzer. So, yeah, I mean, if, if they can get him some alone time on the turrets, you really can crush them because not only can you use the E auto attack reset, you can actually get those the bonus damage from the E, the crits, onto the turret. That works. The Q allows you to actually hit the turrets with that now, too. So you have so many ways to actually get ridiculous damage down that uh, you can shred through those places very, very quickly. Thank you, guys. are continuing to play pretty far forward here. Bang clearly confident in his ability to pick people off with the Sona. As we've actually got the mid laners moved down to bot lane. As here's that free time we were talking about. Hauntzer really wanted with the turret. There's actually still that bit of bonus gold on the table. No turrets have been taken yet. Ooh, Another good shock wave, but Zuzike was stunned this time around. Yeah, still a good little trade. It's not that long of a cooldown, but they're going aggressive. Zazel has no sums. Trying to force a fight. Ulti there from Bang. Maybe a little early, but Keith actually going to be the target. I think they've got enough to take him out. He will go into stasis. Ulti from FBI, not enough, but Keith able to flash out of the way. Kumo has DP'd him, but Keith is going to go down. Golden Glue, scatter the weak, does oh. get it down, and Ulti will shut down Sven. This is actually really good for Golden Guardians because Haunter didn't join. He just takes that turret for free on the top side. That is first turret, solo gold on the Haunter in what was a one-for-one -one trade in that mid lane. Yeah, Keith goes down, but you kill off the jungler, you get more gold on the Fiora, you now have teleport and flash advantage on your top laner, who's your win condition, so Golden Guardians very, very happy about this play. They knew that there was no summoners on Zazel, they knew there was no, no teleport on Shizuke, so they had the confidence to go for it. Also gives him control of the second Rift Herald, so it'll be Golden Guardians splitting this objective as they do take it down. And with that first turret going over, thanks to the sequence of play that just happened, you have to think they'll be able to get one extra turret with that held to watch this one again. 
Okay, here it is one more time. Hook onto Zazel. Early stopwatch to buy time. Uh, Bang does drop his ultimate, but it is just defensively on the Nautilus. And Keith utilizing his stopwatch as well as the flash to kind of back out of there. Keith does go down, but Golden Glue just lights up Sven Skarin. And this is one of those punishing things when you are so many levels down as a jungler. There's an incredible amount of gold and power in each level. It's mean, just the base stats that you gain, right? You're missing thousands of gold of stats for being down those three levels. And the level two ultimate from Syndra means Sven Skarin is just going to get a race and they come out on top in that play. More than enough for that kill there as they do trade. But the Rift Herald still in the inventory of Closer, who's looking to drop that somewhere, maybe bot lane. Although mid is uh, always a priority for teams. Yeah, so EG now going to try to actually force Golden Guardians to fight them at this dragon. They're going to say, you need to come to us or we're going to stack a soul up. And you're going to lose that way. But the side lanes are already pushing. And EG is really slow to actually pull the trigger on, on this play. You can see top lane already shoved in, bot lane pushing in, you know, and it's going to be Kumo having to respond. Now because of this, I was kind of wasted the parry a little bit there. Did get the stun, but you know, because of this, you have teleport advantage on Haunter, and now EG may lose priority. Very sneaky. They land on Dizuke. That's oh. a clean kill for Closer. Kicks away Sven to make sure he lives. Forced to flash. I imagine Safeguard was not back up. But again, they get another TP and get a kill. Yeah, new Bang had ultimate too, so he did want to get out of there. If you get ulted up, you will go down, just as happened to Golden Glue early on. But a great play here no for the jungle mid. Oh, the hook does buff nice it buffer. through. Still getting chased down, though. This looks like lights out. Sense Garen able to pick up Keith. Still, Rift Tail dropped on bot side. That's the tier one going down. If you push one more wave as Golden Glue, which he should do, they have vision on basically everyone around that mid lane. Now, this can threaten a lot of damage on the tier two. You still have teleport advantage on your top lane or Haunter, so. You know, this is what Golden Guardians want to do. They want to spread the map. They want to force EG into tough decisions. EG just wants to group up 5v5 and say, come at me, bro. Fight me at this dragon. But Golden Guardians is enough. forcing them to respond. I think Jazuke will be there in time, but Haunter and Kumo are still duking it out. Time control is ready. Haunter, though, kind of losing the 1v1 already. Chain is out. Here comes the Abyssal Void. Haunter Brox is ultimate. He's got to get away. A decent parry. Does have his flash, but getting chased down. Slowed by the empowered auto by Bang, and that'll be a well-deserved kill for the Sona. Yeah, really nice response there from Zazel and Bang coming in, utilizing that empowered power cord with the E, slowing him down so Haunter could not get out. Haunter was unable to actually land an effective parry, and he had no minions to heal off. Keith hooks in, and he's just going to probably die. Oh, Golden Glue just demolishes Ben oh. Karen. Shockwave catches Closer, but that's not bad. Bang the next one, but he does get devoured. Golden Glue in the front lines. No flash. He's got to get away. He gets exhausted. Good scout of the week to keep Kumo's himself coming. safe. They, they got to run. keep chasing. That's a great flash off from Bang. Finds two. That's one dead. Keith going to be the next target. See you later, Nautilus. As Kumo even gets the knockoff. FBI, no flash. Going to have to run. Gets out from under the chain. Gets the root as well, and they will survive. But these two teams just fighting blow for blow. Yeah, they're going right at it, back and forth. But you can see how Ichi starts to really control the fight in the extended play, right? You know, the longer this goes, the better it looks. And Keith going in here, it looks like it was going to be a one-way trip, just go down immediately. They spend a lot of their burst to take down Sven Skarin. This shockwave largely avoided by Golden Guardians, which gives them the confidence to go in. But remember, a lot of your cooldowns are down. The ultimate from Golden Glue actually got denied by the Devourer from Zazel. Then EG says, all right, you no longer have lethal damage. If you cannot burst someone 100 to zero, you will not kill them through the shielding and healing of Sona, as well as the shielding of the Orianna and the protection of that Tom Kench. So Golden Guardian just fighting off more than they could chew there. You've got to be really aware of how much damage you have left in the tank. Can you 100 to zero someone? If you cannot, you need to disengage from that fight and play it slow. Man, it's too low here. In a 4v3, Golden Guardians cannot defend. So they will lose that turret and maybe the Drake soon after as well. Yep. GG. Goes to the area pretty easily, and in fact, Golden Guardians will just give it up. So that is going to be the second Drake, the first of the Soul Drakes here as that ocean will go down. Still a little while to go, that's kind of what happens when you split the first few Drakes. There's not as much pressure unless the game drags on a little bit longer. Yeah, I mean, they split back and forth on those first two, and then that third was delayed a long time. Uh, so it's going to be some time, and you know, Kumo has held up very well in this side lane. Their Tom Kent's response was great on that earlier kill to take down Haunter and punish him. And it looked like Kumo was just straight up winning that 1v1 anyway. You know, the straight 100 to 0 all in is difficult at this point because when you're hitting that Bramble Vest, it's reducing so much of your healing, right? You more have to kind of wear down the Aatrox and heal up off the minions utilizing the Ravnus Hydra. 
you know, until you have more items coming through, you know, until you have the Tribalors and maybe even an item on top of that, where you can just kind of shrug off a lot of that Aatrox damage. Monster has about 1,200 gold to go and spend and is recalling, so we'll have Triforce I think then. we'll have enough. Yep. See if that does change the texture of the matchup at all, but still looking pretty comfortable in the side lanes yeah. here. Doesn't seem like time to panic, certainly on either side, but Golden Guardians at least maneuvering themselves into a position where they want Haunter to be. Gold, regardless, so still staying close. It is really all those turrets. That's the big lead here for Golden Guardians, but the total gold lead is actually only a thousand between the two teams. Yeah, I mean, that's what those extra kills will do for you, right? You know, those were very big for EG, and you can see that Bang as well as Yuzuke scaling up very, very well. Uh, that Archangels has transformed into Sarah, so the shielding is now there. Additionally for Bang, makes it harder to take him down. Yuzuke on two big items, and you know, it's not time to panic for either side, but for Golden Guardians, they have to be worried about the Ocean Soul. The Ocean Soul on top of all the healing and, and kind of shielding oh and, and defensive abilities that EG has will probably make them unassailable. So, you know, they have a while, but this third dragon coming up in three minutes, it starts to get pretty scary if you give over three dragons because then one pick, one missed 50-50 means you give over soul and you probably lose the game. So Golden Guardians have got to get themselves in the best possible position to either delay this potential dragon or get a pick and then take it themselves. I think we are going to see a lot of this map positioning, though. Looks like Golden Blue is being told to go off and catch waves as they push the other side lane. Haunza is perma in the side lane here. He's actually going to try his hand at a 1v1 on Kuma. One level down. Decent parry. Keeps moving forward. Has not committed the ulti just yet. And Aatrox with his ultimate cooking too much right now for Haunter. Though, as you've mentioned, more, more poking him down at this point Oops. as Bang finally finds an air ball. Oh, he goes through the shockwave key. Little dude my forward. He's going to pop the stone plate and FBI is going to blow up the rack side. Bang kicked in. There's the devour though for Zazel. He's going to save Bang, but Keith right there with a hook ready to go. Bang getting low for Kazuke. Just too powerful. Finally, Golden Blue is able to find the second kill. And they're going to head to Baron off this. This is Bang down. That's Fenskaren down. They are pinging onto it, running over to this area. We'll see if they can catch it, and without Zona or Rek'Sai, this becomes very, very difficult, but I don't think they can actually commit to it. The res timers are too short, so Golden Guardians will just get some vision off it. They will get a little bit of kill goal, but that was a well-played fight from them, and did cost a fair number of resources, did cost the flash off the of support and their jungler, which is a lot of their playmaking ability. I think the big one for me, though, is Haunts' TP. Mm -hmm. You know, he TP'd into that fight to try and maybe win it a bit harder going to be a little bit trickier for him to yeah. really pressure the sideline, especially given how long bot lane is. Yeah, he may have to play top side now with Baron up and, and allow Golden Glue, utilizing that TP to play on the bottom side. But let's watch this one more time. A lot of it is about the scatter. Ooh. So the scatter actually came down. Bang had buffered his ultimate. So what happened there is Bang presses ult as he's in range. But during the animation of Bang's ultimate, he is actually knocked backwards by Golden Glue, pushing him out of range. So that is what Golden Glue, I think, was actually going for on that turret dive, where it kind of looks silly. But then we saw Closer come in with the kick flash, very nicely done to pull him back towards Keith, who could then follow up and kind of train down Bang. But even there, we saw how close EG was to actually surviving and stabilizing in that fight where they can start to heal up the turret. EG have also just committed to running five in the other lane. They're yep. ignoring Haunter for now. They're going to take down this mid-tier too. In fact, the only two towers they've taken so far have been both in mid lane. Yeah, but I don't think Haunter has enough time, right? You know, he's not actually going to be able to get to that turret. So all he really did was push up the wave a little bit. They trade their tier two for that. Um, but Haunter is going to have to be able to get into a position where he can actually start to win this 1v1, where he can start to really pressure towers. And he's not there yet. Great shockwave on Keith. Yep, over the wall. Wolfie out from Aphelios. Does get a big stun there. And that's going to be a kill against Ben Scaren, eating every Syndra ultimate. But Kumos here going to try and turn the tide to the fight. Haunter, though, has made it in. This is great. That's a big pick for Golden Guardians. Keith may want to reset, but the dragon is just about to spawn, so I think they're just going to run straight over and try to take it. Jizuke, critically, is fairly low on mana. Kumo has no ultimate, so Golden Guardians should be able to take this dragon, and that means it extends the clock so much on their split push game plan on avoiding EG's 5v5 and really being able to spread out the map because that is another five minutes now that EG will have to wait for even the potential of taking a Dragon Soul. We're sitting at 2-2 two to two at this point, and that clock is always ticking on Fiora. It's kind of scaling in the background here. 
20,000 gold up now for Golden Guardians. And I do like that EG seems to be very aware of the situation. And I mean, they have the Tump Control, which I think is why Hornsa didn't extend too far down after they dipped out of mid from taking the tower. But also just EG are very confidently saying, okay, just everyone get in the lane and start pushing, because you have to give Fiora the least amount of time possible to kill your base. Yeah, and I mean, we're, we're seeing Sven Skerrin really get picked on here. You know, you are going what are you to gonna standard do? damage build as Rek'Sai, and he's so damn squishy. Tom Kench is not really positioned with him because he's, you know, really focusing on defending the main carries, the Sona, the Orianna. So anytime Sven gets hooked, if Zazel's not there to devour immediately, he basically just dies to Golden Glue. And yep. Golden Glue and Keith are actually comboing up very well alongside FBI for the follow-up damage to really burst down Sven Skaren time and time again. And we are seeing Golden Glue now, you know, out to a really strong set of items. He's sitting on Death Cap, Ludens, plus double spell pen. This is incredibly efficient, amping all the spell damage that he already has, and it does mean Syndra can hit that lethal damage with her combo very easily. It does feel like Sven Skaren's chance of survival is just dropping a negative every single yeah. fight. Jazuke, <laughs> though, does get a top lane out of turret, so a bit of counter pushing there on a side lane for EG this time around, but now it's Golden Guardians that are pressuring the tower. 4v4, actually 4v3 as Sven Skarin is going to run back in. Hauntzer looking to pressure the base as well. You know, he's all the way up here. If too many people respond, we can see EG continue to pressure, uh, get pressured rather in that mid lane. But with the minions dead, Golden Guardian is going to have to play it safe, going back off and just continuing to try to establish more vision here. You can see just how important the you know, mid lane priority has been for these two teams, trying to get the shove, trying to clear out any wards. You know how badly uh, Golden Guardians are, are really trying to avoid any potential TP flank when, you know, look at all these pinks in this area, right? This is actually to clear out any deep vision from the opposing team to try to stop any potential TP flanks coming through. You know, everything really is about it feels like trying to avoid the 5v5, trying to deny vision and control this mid lane. And hopefully he really needed to, but oh no, Haunter has just been sticking in the one lane here in bottom. His TP will be up well before Kumus is Whoa. bang though, but for the flash, ulti and does miss. Hook now gonna land in onto Zazel, who has used the Devour. But this time Haunter, again, doesn't have his TP, is willing to stay in bot lane. EG need to find something, they will maybe catch Keith, but the kickback in onto Kumo is gonna grab the shutdown, and now it's a 4v4 with Haunter in the bot lane. All they have to do is buy time. They just need to stop EG from getting back to the base, and Haunter will take the inhibitor, so they just need to push this up, harass EG on any potential recalls, don't commit to anything, you do not need to fight, so it is gonna be the retreating Tom Kench ultimate trying to get back to the base, but I think it may be too late. He could potentially commit to this. We'll back off and play it safe for now, though. So shoving down mid. Jazuke gonna get followed, flashed on Keith. Looking for it, no ulti, though. And the GOP will keep him alive. Good shockwave back. The stone plate will keep Keith alive, but only barely, as Haunta does finish off the inhib. Yeah, that is such a big turn of events for Golden Guardians. Being able to get that kick. Again, closer. Really nice kick back onto the Aatrox. And now they're on the Baron. And guess what? There's still the threat of this Fiora on the bottom side. Fiora is on vision, but has teleport. Golden Guardians are going to be able to get this Baron. There's no way that EG can even contest at this point. And Golden Guardians are playing a fantastic game. Yep, no vision here. They do have a war, but they'd have to blind TP for the Baron, which doesn't really sound like a very attractive option. No time. Ken Schultz was already used. And with Haunter having too much pressure, it is a nice run of objectives for Golden Guardians. Pick into Inhibitor, into Mid Tower, into Baron. I'm really hoping we're gonna get to see a replay on, on that Miss Sona ultimate. You know, it kind of looked like Bang didn't get the full distance on his flash before the ultimate went off. I'm not positive about that, so I would like to be able to rewatch that one more time. Uh, we'll see if we'll get that replay, but you know, Golden Guardians now on the Baron power play here. Lots are going for actually a, a fairly defensive build. It's actually building towards a Spirit Visage as that third item. That is pretty interesting here. So I think he, he's feeling like he may have to actually commit to a fight, you know, look for that 5v5 to actually close out the game and maybe feels they're going to be in a spot to do it. There is a lot of magic damage coming out from the Sona plus the Orianna, so that would make some sense there. But for now, they have pressure on that bottom side. They have the Baron buff, and let's watch this one more time. So did Bang actually get full distance? Uh, he is going to actually look for it. And We'll just kind of watch, yeah. So he did, but that was actually just pretty far away. You know, was pretty optimistic. Maybe could have tagged someone on the very edge of that, but that does sometimes speak to one of the things that we talked about last year when they just kind of came into the bot lane, is that sometimes you saw the players weren't fully comfortable, didn't know those ranges as well as they would on on the standard marksman champions because if they put thousands and thousands of games in on your Caitlyn's and your Zayas and whatever, how many games does he really have played on Sona? Probably not that many. 
certainly not. And certainly his earlier ults did look better, but yep. that was always going to be a very difficult ult to hit for the most experienced of Sona players. And it's it, a casting one. Yeah, and it, it kind of feels like EG getting desperate when maybe they didn't need to. I mean, now they're behind a Baron there and hits a down in bot. They have super minions crashing everywhere. Like, now this looks bad. Yeah. 5k down. But before that, EG were playing a fairly controlled game, just letting the, the Sona scale up and answering the map movements nicely. But Golden Guardians just broken it open off that one little misstep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they were you know, in a pretty good spot, but you could feel that maybe they're a little bit too worried about the Fiora, right? And, and Fiora taking over this game, but it's going to be engaged on this top side. Keith again into stone plate. He goes fairly tanky. Good old there. Finds a triple root for FBI. But uh, I think he's gone here. Yep, Kumo going to get the finish off. Ponsu in the meantime playing PvP. Yeah, I mean, he knocks down that turret. It is going to be that flank here from Zazel, but he's by himself. Got ulti as well by the Rek'Sai. I don't Haunter. think you win this. Oh, he's going for it. He wants to kill Spence Garen. Gets exhausted. 1v3 goes Haunza. As the rest of your team tries to fend it off, make it a 1v4. Haunza flashes out of there. And Golden Guardian's going to finish up the top in him. <laughs> yeah, when I see Sven ulting in on Haunza, the level 12 Rek'Sai diving on this level 17 Fiora. It's not the fight you want, and when no one came in the belly of Zazel there, they just weren't going to have enough damage to actually kill off that Fiora. So, well played by Haunter to actually force them back, survive, buy time for another inhibitor take, and another dragon going to be grabbed up here by Golden Guardians. They just feel like they are in full control, and it's funny to look at the scoreline. You know, when you talk about this game, it feels like Haunter has had a really big impact, and the Fiora is really kind of dictating, I think, a lot of how EG is playing this game. Haunter's 0 1 and 0. Yep. Right? You know, it's it's not like the scoreline is really showing you the impact that it has had, but it's been a lot about this pick, and I think it was an intelligent one. You know, anytime you see these, these Sona type comps, these kind of solo lane or, or really kind of gold heavy Sona picks, uh, you don't want a 5v5. And I think Golden Guardians have done a great job of, of finding ways to avoid it and finding ways to take fights on their turn. Yep, certainly seems like this is a strategy they're comfortable with. As the, the other side of the 1-4, four, the 4 have been playing well also. Yep, very but, uh, We are going to have to converge in mid lane at this point, because there's one more in here to try and take out. The third Drake also went over Haunter, actually. 